end of service tonight, after uh, the, the time around the Word, we're actually going to end the service in prayer and uh, pray for God's blessings on our church, on our families. And uh, but before we do that, I want you to go ahead and turn to the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and we're going to read quite a few verses, um, and, uh, and then we will uh, get into the, uh, to the message tonight. But as you're turning there, I, I do have a praise item. Many of you know that I have been driving around in a truck with no heater core. I now have a heater core. Uh, I got some money for Christmas. Praise the Lord. I was able to take it down to a shop on Fort Campbell Boulevard. And uh, they, uh, they fixed my heater core. It's got a brand new one in it. Man, it will run you out of there. So I am very thankful for that. And uh, so just for your information. John chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. I was trying to um, find the mind of the Lord and, and where we needed to be tonight and thinking about this past year um, and also this coming year. And I really um, was very impressed upon this particular um, <clears throat> passage of Scripture and this message. Uh, and then Sunday, God has really been challenging me uh, from 1 Peter chapter 1. And so Sunday's message, Lord willing, is coming from 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, but uh, John chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. <clears throat> then cometh he into the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat the, uh, thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus answered and her, or said unto her, Thou hast said, Well, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. And, um, in that saidst thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is this place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you worship, you know not what. We know that we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When is he come? Uh, I'm sorry, when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city uh, and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? 
Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meanwhile, his disciples praying him, prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have no meat to eat that you know of. That you, I'm sorry, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, uh, said the disciples one to the other, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not you, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence tonight, and we recognize that without your presence, all of this is vain. God, we recognize tonight that the word that we have read is not our word, it is your word. It is the true, the living Word of God. And it's not just uh, something that was penned down by men. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we, we thank You that we have the Word of God tonight. Lord, without it, we would have no direction on how to love You and how to serve You. And so, Lord, we just thank You tonight that we can read the Word of God, that we live in a country that we can read the Word uh, openly and freely without um, repercussion. So, God, I pray for the blessing of the reading of the Word of God tonight to our hearts. I pray, God, that uh, for those who should have been here tonight, Lord, you know what the reasons are. And, Lord, you are the judge of that. Lord, I pray that if they should have been here, there was nothing hindering. Lord, I pray that you would help them to uh, realize that and realize the importance of God's house. Lord, I pray for uh, those who are sick tonight that you would bless them. Lord, most of all tonight, we pray that you would meet with us. We pray, God, that the Holy Spirit of God would have his perfect will and way in our lives tonight. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for all that we have and all that we are through Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. As we look back on this past year, I can see the hand of God. I, I think about what God has done in this place even this year. And I think, really, the word wow comes into mind because... There have been a lot of folks that have come to know Jesus as their Savior. But when you look around, like in a service, particularly like on a service like tonight, on a Wednesday night, and although I am so glad to have everyone that is here here, you look and you see all these empty pews. That means we've got some work to do. There is some spiritual growth that needs to take place. And so we need to be praying for those folks who have come to know the Lord. Pray for those who need to grow more in their faith, uh, which I believe is all of us, by the way. But God has blessed us this year. He's truly blessed us as a church. We have seen quite a few people come to know the Lord. As a matter of fact, we have seen much more than the, than the usual moving of God in people's hearts. When you look at the data in the average church in America, you find, I want you to listen to this because I, I look, read something about this and I thought, man, surely this is not the truth. But it is. When you look at the data in an average church in America, you find that only one person is being reached with the gospel for every 40 to 60 church members. That's America, folks. That's where we're at today. Every 40 to 60 people, there's only one person coming to know Christ. Do you think that's biblical? Do you really think it's biblical? I'm glad for that one because the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over just one. So I'm not trying to, to downplay the importance of one soul. But I also know this. The Bible calls us to bear much fruit. And if we're not reaching out to people, then we're not uh, giving the, the gospel call to people like God wants us to. But 40, I, I'm sorry, one person being reached out of every 40 to 60 church members and even where you find numerical growth, you're more than likely going to find growth that is called transfer growth. That is, people transfer from one church to another, just back and forth, back and forth. And I want to tell you, recently, without sharing any detail, something that I experienced um, that I read, and it just, I'm just like, oh my goodness. There was a particular pastor, and this pastor um, was talking about how that there were no young couples in their church, you know, and that they were really praying that God would send them some young couples. And knowing the situation, I know that God did, well, I'm going to say God did it. There were some young couples going to that church. Well, the problem is, those couples were not being reached like God expects us to go out into the highways and hedges, compel people to come in. Those people came from other churches. 
those young couples used to attend another church and now they're attending this church and I'm thinking there's something wrong with that situation. I believe that you need to be faithful to your church. I believe that. I believe you don't need to be church hopping. I believe you need to be faithful. God has given us this place. By the way, I'm not talking about our church, okay? So don't get me wrong. I'm talking about something else, another church, a uh, situation with another church. So don't think I'm thinking, okay, some other church then got some of our young church members. That's not what I was going with that, okay? So don't, don't, don't read into that and what is not there. But, but here's the thing. We need, to, we need to not only love God supremely, but I believe God would challenge us to be faithful where we are. You know, not some time ago, I was talking, quite a few years ago, I was talking to a couple, and, and this couple was very unsatisfied with where they were going to church. And, and you know, I kept telling me basically that they felt led to do something different. And I said, well, what is that something different? And the couple said, well, we don't know yet. And I said, well, let me tell you what my advice is. You stay faithful to your church until God calls you to do something else. And, and folks, I'm telling you, I don't believe God calls us to be church hoppers. And see, that's where a lot of growth is coming today. People are leaving smaller churches, so they go to these bigger churches and get lost in the crowd, and there's no accountability and all that, you know. And there's nothing wrong with big churches. I used to attend one. Nothing wrong with that. Where the problem is, is where people are, are saying, oh, look at how our church is growing, and it's growing because people are moving from one church to another. And that is not what the gospel call is. We are to evangelize. That is, we're to get out there and, and reach people for the Lord. Um, it's called transfer growth from one church to another. While sometimes I know that for doctrinal purposes and really good reasons people go from one church to another, that really is not evangelism. Okay, We're talking about trying to reach people for the Lord. That is simply sheep shuffling. That's another uh, one of my brothers in Christ uh, mentioned that phrase, sheep shuffling. While there are many things that are fitting and proper for the church to do today, such as admonishment, edification, and I could go on and on with that, I think that many churches today are missing out on the primary thing of evangelism and discipleship. We, I believe, folks, that we are trying our best as individuals because I see people coming and visiting the church and I hear that so-and-so has invited them and so-and-so has invited them, and that's great, and we need to continue to do that because that's how you get people into the church. You get them saved, you get them serving the Lord. So we need to continue to do that. But you know what? I honestly, folks, believe that we need to do a better job this year of discipleship. And I'll tell you how I think we need to do it. We need to do it through Sunday school. We need to get people coming into Sunday school. And if that's what you want to call a small group, that's what I call a small group is Sunday school. Let's get folks to come to Sunday school and learn more about the Lord so that they can grow spiritually so they in turn can go out and witness to people. And uh, that's the important thing. While I think that we're on the right track, there are many things that we can do better. One of the things that I would like for us to do uh, to focus more on this coming year, again, is discipleship and doing that for Sunday school. But I want to go back to evangelism. And I want us to look at tonight seven things. I was reading an article by Tom Rainer, um, and I wanted to share. There are seven things that Tom has identified, um, and things, reasons why that we should evangelize. Reasons why that the church should be focused on evangelism. And I wanted to share those with you tonight. The first thing is this. Because Christ commanded us to be focused on evangelism. We, as we look at our, which is not up there tonight, but as we look at our logo, GC Squared, the Great Commission, the Great Commandment, the Great Commission, it's found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world." Christ commanded us to be involved in evangelism. Not just as a church are we to try to reach out into our community, but specifically as individuals, we are to reach out into our community. And here's the thing. I mentioned a couple of Sundays ago that I really felt like that this year God wanted us to focus on a certain thing, and that is this. One reaching one. Okay, That is, every one of us having one person... Now, some of you may want to say, i got ten people on my mind and heart that I want to reach for the Lord. And that's great. 
But I want all of us to make a commitment to reach one person for Christ. I mean, think about it, folks. One person, a whole year, you've got to try to reach one person for the Lord. And what happens if you reach that person? Are you to be satisfied? No. You need to go on to the next one. But I'm just saying, our goal, if everyone would reach one, then what would happen? Can you can you imagine what would happen? What would happen? Build the church. It would double and it would overfill the church. Um, I mean, think about it, folks. Uh, what what a great way that that would be, would, would, would be for the Lord. Um, what a great thing that that would be if we would one would reach one. All right, number one, why are we evangelized? Because Christ commanded it. Number two, because Christ is the only way of salvation. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's no way around that. Salvation is exclusive. Now, salvation is all-inclusive in the fact that Jesus wants everybody to be saved. But it is exclusive in the fact that there's just one way. There's not many ways to heaven. There's just one. We need to learn to be good communicators of that exclusive, narrowly defined hope. Get that. Exclusive, narrowly defined hope. I can't preach God's Word, be true to God's Word, by saying there's more than one way of salvation. And neither can you. We need to preach the exclusiveness of the Gospel and that it's only through Jesus. He is the only way of hope. But then also, number three, why evangelism? Number three, because Christ died for the world. John chapter 3, verse 16. We know that verse. We know it better than we know most things in life, if you're a Christian. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There is a reason John 3.16 is the most popular and most quoted verse in the history of humanity. Jesus died for the world. He is the only way. But as He provided the way, He has provided the way for everyone. That is the message that is urgent and worth telling. Indeed, it is the greatest message that has ever been told. Jesus wants everyone to be saved. That's the why of evangelism. But number four, because churches that are not intentional about evangelism are typically weak in evangelism. Many pastors and church leaders will focus uh, teaching and preaching on the priority of evangelism, but do little in practicing it themselves. Think about that. And I'm not talking about just church pastors and church leaders. I'm talking about all of us. We can talk a big talk. And we can talk about, hey, it's important to reach people for Jesus. But what are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? That's the important thing. Not just be a hearer of the Word, but a doer of the Word. What kind of priority does evangelism hold in your life personally? One thing that I want us to focus on this year again is one reaching one. I know that there's someone in your, on your heart right now. I know there is. Because there are times, it's from time to time, even this past year, when I've said, hey, there's somebody in your heart on a Sunday morning. I've done it several times. And I mean, I, I could not see any hand that was not raised in the church that said, hey, I got somebody on my heart and mind that I know need Jesus. What are we going to do about it this year? I, folks, I really do not believe, according to the Scripture, that we got a whole lot of time left. I really believe that time is short. And we talk a lot about reaching people for the Lord. When's the last time we took out, we literally stepped out on faith and said this, you know what? I want to tell you about Jesus. I am concerned enough about your soul, and I am not worried about the response that I want to get from you. I'm concerned about your soul, and so I'm going to share the gospel with you. When is the last time that we prayed for someone that needed salvation? When's the last time that we asked God to place on our heart a burden for someone who needs to know Jesus? When's the last time that we cared enough about somebody to say, let me tell you about the Lord? I dare say that if it's just one out of 40 to 60 church members, one person gets saved for every 40 to 60 church members, folks, we've got a lot of work to do. We have got a lot of work to do in this area of evangelism. Time is short, and we need to take the time seriously. Will we make a commitment to God that we're going to do the best we can to reach that one this year? Number five, why evangelism? Because churches tend to obsess inwardly when they fail to move outwardly. Think about this. 
While we think we make attempts to reach people and get them into the church, I think more can be done to reach people for Christ. You see, a lot of churches today have the club mentality. And what I mean by that is, it's, hey, let's just take care of one another. Don't worry about anybody else. And it's more inwardly focused than it is outwardly focused. And we're going to hopefully try to make some changes this year where we can even make even more outward kind of stuff going on. And that is what God's called us to do. But number six, why have evangelism? Because churches become content and complacent with transfer growth. Man, our church is growing. It's doing great. And it's all because people go from this church to this church. Some churches are growing. Others are adding members without significant growth. But many of both categories are growing at the expense of other churches. Folks, there are churches closing their doors every day. Every day. And the smaller churches are getting smaller and the bigger churches are getting bigger. And we're closing the doors of the churches. Well, we, we shouldn't have to do that. Even those smaller churches should continue to grow. And I know there's a lot of factors in there as to why they're not growing. And I, I know, I'm, pretty, I'm assured that there are some things that I know on my mind right now as to why that is. But rather than leaving this church and it going under, why don't you stick in there? Now I'm not talking about this church <laughs> because we're doing good, okay? We need to do better. But I'm just saying, smaller churches are going under. They're closing the doors. And there are communities that are losing churches. We need to pray for them, and we need to encourage folks to hang in there and to keep on keeping on for the Lord. You know, I'm glad that we've got churches like our home missions churches, um, like one, we've got one over Memphis, uh, where Brother Tim Osborne was before he passed away. And I am glad to say that we've got a guy named Scott B. who has gone in there and he and his family have taken the reins of that work. And things are going great. They've, they've continued to keep up what Tim Osborne is doing. And I'm telling you, the church is growing and people are being saved. And it is awesome. But we need to continue to pray for those, especially those churches that are, that are just you know, getting started. And pray that God would bless them. We don't need to become content and complacent. We need to always be trying to reach more and more people for the Lord. That's what He's called us to do. But then also the last thing, the why of evangelism, because evangelistic Christians actually grow stronger as better discipled Christians. Let me tell you what's going to happen. If you make a commitment and you say, I'm going to try to reach that person for the Lord, you may have not have ever witnessed anybody before, or at least made an, a good effort to witness to someone. You may have invited them to church, but I'm talking about going a step farther than just inviting folks to church. I'm talking about saying, hey, let me tell you about how to be a Christian. Let me tell you who Jesus is. And taking that step of faith and saying, you know what, this is what God has called all of us to do, and so I'm going to be obedient to Christ, and I'm going to do this. I'll tell you what it's going to do. Not only is it going to increase your faith as you witness to others, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to cause you to get in the Word of God more. You know why? Because people are going to confront you about your faith. When you go to witness to them, they're going to ask you some tough questions. And you're going to be like, man, I thought I knew a lot of things, but I don't know as much as I thought. I've got to get back in the Word of God. And it will, get, it will help you to grow spiritually yourself because you're going to say, oh, I don't know the answer to that, but let me get back with you. And you go home and you study it yourself. I challenge you, get involved in evangelism. Get involved in reaching people for the Lord. And I know we've got quite a few young people here. As a matter of fact, we've got almost as many young people as we've got older people tonight. But you know what? Just because, Bailey, how old are you? You're eight, okay? And Carolina, how old are you? Thirteen, all right? So we got an eight-year-old, we got a thirteen-year-old, and anything in between, right? As far as our kids go. Is it just adults' job to witness for Christ? No. Isn't it your job too? You guys, right? Everybody that knows Jesus, isn't it all of our jobs? It is. That's right. So we are to give the gospel to everyone. And children are to be a part of that. You know, I remember when I was a teenager, one of the things I thought was, oh, well, particularly a young teenager, it was like, well, man, that's my preacher's job to witness. You know, all I got to do is come to church and listen and learn. That's just part of it. We're to be involved. And so no matter if you're 8 years old or if you're 13 or if you're 100 years old, it's all of our jobs to evangelize the world and to reach people for Him. So, the Great Commission today has become the Great Omission. 
Evangelism is dying, churches are dying, and people are going to hell without Christ. The question is, what are we going to do about it? We have got a great commission that our great Heavenly Father has given us. The Lord Jesus Himself, before He ascended back into heaven, He said, You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. You may say, Brother Wayne, I have failed this year to be a witness like I should for Christ. Well, this is the last day of this year. You've got a whole new year coming up tomorrow. You've got a fresh start. Why don't we make a commitment for all of us to reach one? All of us to reach one. I've already got the person on my mind that God has challenged me with. And I'm going to tell you, folks, it's a tough challenge. Okay? But I know that this person can be reached because I know Jesus can save anybody. So the question is, do you have somebody on your heart and will you make a commitment to reach that one this year for the Lord? Tell you what I want us to do. I told you I wanted us to gather up front and have prayer and praying in the new year. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Those who would like, if you want to come up and pray, that's fine. If you want to sit in your pew, you can do that as well. Um, but uh, why don't we gather around the altar for those who want to and just pray God's blessings on our, ourselves, our families, our, our church, and just pray that God would bless us uh, this coming year.